Coming up in this episode. Like if I'm just eating beans and rice, I'm going to eat, you know, I'm going to massively overeat carbs and fats to get to my 100 grams of protein. But if I really go out of my way to leverage protein and I'm eating lean meat and green veggies, okay, maybe I'm going to eat 150 grams of protein, but wow, am I done eating at a much lower carb and fat intake? And that's where the magic happens. That's how that's how it works. It's not really a quote unquote high protein diet. It's a high protein percentage. Right. And that resonates with the protein leverage hypothesis, suggesting that protein is one of the key things that signals satiety. So if you're getting that protein in first and in a way that's protein efficient in terms of percentages, then you're Pro, or your fat and carbohydrate intake is much lower. So you're getting a lot less of this kind of useless extra energy. Right, exactly. Welcome to the HVMN Podcast. What we do with our bodies today becomes the foundation of who we are tomorrow. This is Health Via Modern Nutrition. Hey everyone, this is your host, Jeff Wu. I hope and trust that you and your family are doing well. We're in the first, second week of April, so a lot of the country is still fighting through COVID-19 right now, but some regions of America are doing better than others. Some areas are kind of going through the peak right now, just going through the peak, and the other states are just going to be entering the peaks in the next couple of weeks here. So best of luck, stay safe out there. But today, we're going to be talking to Dr. Ted Naiman. You might have seen his work with the PE diet, and he has a very interesting structure and framework, how to think about nutrition in a way that's a little bit different from the typical holy wars of nutrition that you see today with low fat versus low carb. Dr. Naiman, great to have you in the program. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So how are you holding up? I know that you're in Seattle, which was one of the early hot spots for COVID-19. How are you, the family, and, 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 and the hospital system that you're working with? How, how's everyone doing? We're doing okay. Yeah, we're hanging in there. Uh, it looks like we've already peaked around here and we're on the other side of it. And right now, there's no projections for running out of ICU beds. And uh, so we're kind of like hanging in there. I think we've actually flattened the curve. I think we're the social distancing is working around here. Um, I mean, it's it's bad, but it's not like a full scale disaster. So yeah, we're hanging in there. How about you? Yeah, that's really good to hear. Um, fortunately, uh, same in terms of just the personal side, you know, f- direct friends, direct family, and, and all of my colleagues at HVMN are currently safe and healthy and hopefully let's keep it that way but just broadly speaking in the bay area it's been reasonably flattened as well but i do have friends or hospitalists and i think everyone's cautiously optimistic that there isn't going to be some uptick in the coming weeks and it seems that like on the west coast especially the ppe and the equipment seems to be okay for now so hopefully the rest of the country the rest of the world can follow in the footsteps here so we all make it through yeah yeah good glad to hear it so your book i think is particularly interesting to me because and maybe to give a context for our listeners who aren't quite up to speed on your work i would say that the current dogmatic argument on social media between nutrition seems to be mainly low fat versus low carb and within those families you have sub families of carnivore, keto, vegan diets. I'm an engineer by training. I really like the way you articulate through your book, The PE Diet, that you should really look at fat and carbohydrate as energy. And, and, and that, that's essentially the role of those metabolic substrates. What is your background and what led you to the realizations in the PE Diet? Well, um, uh, first of all, it's cool to hear that you have an engineering background. I really didn't know that. Um, and I'd love to hear more about about that. Uh, I myself got a mechanical engineering degree before I went to med school. And so I, I almost can't help but look at everything through a mechanical engineering lens. Like I, I can't stop myself from doing that. And I really came at the PE diet from this mechanical engineering background. And that, that kind of formed the basis for all of my work in the book, honestly. 
Yeah, I, I'm a computer scientist by training. So very much a kind of a systems approach with inputs into mm -hmm. a, a system, you know, whether that's software or a mechanical system, and you have certain types of outputs that you kind of engender out. So I think my interest going into nutrition was very much from an optimization performance perspective. But I'm sure, as you know, there's much fewer people that can really claim that they're in the optimization phase of, of their trajectory. You know, most Americans, 88%, if not more or less, somewhere around that range, have metabolic dysfunction. So I think the broader problem is how do we bring people from kind of deficient states? And I think nutrition is one of the biggest levers there into a more normalized state. So it, I think it's kind of interesting just in terms of kind of the other commentators out there who are doing independent research or writing articles seem to have kind of this engineering background that might, that I wouldn't say is atypical for medical doctors. Cause I think doctors do come from a lot of different types of undergraduate training, but it seems that some of the leading voices do have a, a little bit of more of a rigorous quantitative background. Is that your sense in terms of kind of the emerging voices in the, in the space of nutrition? Oh, I don't know. I think I gravitate towards people who have some sort of engineered um, <laughs> background like you and I. So anytime they have something to say that seems really geeked out, then I'm all ears. So I, I might be like artificially selecting for people who are saying the same sort of things I am. But yeah, I do feel like there's a, a handful of people with this sort of uh, computer science or engineering uh, background who have dipped their toe into the nutrition space. And I love it whenever that happens because these people are coming at it from the same mindset that I am. And I, that's that's probably why you liked <laughs> you like my book. And thank you very much. But yeah, I do I do think that's the the great minority. But there is a little little bit of uh, increased visibility in some of we nerd types who've who've gotten involved in nutrition. So what was the initial foray personally for you thinking about the macronutrients as energy substrates? I mean, obviously, I think if you look at the textbook, calories are essentially units of measuring energy. Uh, but I would say that traditional methodology of teaching nutrition is, I would say, fairly biochemistry, looking at it from the biochemical level, which I obviously is a part of the picture here. But I'm curious, like, what caused you to kind of shift the paradigm to look at it as an energy problem first? Well, I kind of backed into the position I'm in. And I backed into it from researching insulin resistance. So, you know, I've been in practice for 20 years now, and I've always been interested in insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, because this is something that seems to be seen in the vast majority of chronic degenerative diseases. So if you look at anyone who has a chronic degenerative disease, the odds that they have some amount of metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance is really, really high. And there's this huge crossover between metabolic syndrome and all sorts of chronic degenerative diseases, pretty much anything you could name from cancer to cardiometabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, all of the autoimmune diseases. There's all of this crossover into metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance. So I've been studying insulin resistance since forever. And I think only recently have we really figured out what insulin resistance actually is. And it's literally the state of trying to store too much energy inside your body. I, I got more and more interested in, in this energy toxicity or the concept of too much energy in your body. And so I researched, you know, what actually happens to macronutrients after you eat them. And it, it's very interesting that we have these three very separate uh, energy storage pools in the body. Uh, there's protein, which is actually stored to some amount. We didn't previously think it was, but protein and amino acids are stored in your muscle and in some splanchnic beds in your body. And then you have storage for glucose, which is very tiny glycogen, mostly in your liver and muscles. And then you've got fat storage, which of course predominates by a couple order, orders of magnitude. And so most everyone with insulin resistance is energy toxic from literally having too much fat in their body, typically from one of two reasons, either ingesting too much fat because all ingested fat is basically stored in your adipocytes or by eating too much 
glycemic or digestible carbohydrate, which uh, disrupts fat oxidation or displaces fat oxidation in a isocaloric fashion. So for all the glycemic carbs you eat, you offset fat oxidation and then fat accumulates. And so all of these people end up having literally too much fat in their body, too much fat in their adipocytes. And then once you filled up your subcutaneous fat stores and it spills over into your visceral fat and your ectopic fat and fat in your liver and your pancreas, then you have full-blown insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. So I kind of backed into this place where I realized, oh, um, insulin resistance is energy toxicity. There's literally too much energy in your body and you've literally ingested too much energy and then I, I figured out specifically what that would involve, either eating carbohydrate, which displaces fat oxidation, or ingesting too much fat that you don't have room for. And then I kind of went down the rabbit hole of, well, why? Why would anyone eat too much energy? Like, why would you do that? Why doesn't your body stop you? And uh, eventually, I came to the position that I have in the PE diet where you're always overeating energy because you either need to, and that's because protein and minerals and nutrients have been displaced out of your diet with energy from refined carbs and re refined fats, or because you want to overeat because you're eating high energy density carbs and fats together, which tend to be extremely addictive and drive overeating in some sort of seasonal fattening for wintertime type phenomenon. Yeah, I would say I really, really backed into it from this position of, okay, there's too much energy in your body. Why is that? And somewhere along the line, I realized that the low carb people are totally right because eating glucose displaces fat oxidation. But then eating uh, fat, too much fat is a problem also, because really there's too much fat in your body when you have metabolic syndrome. And so I sort of backed into this position where uh, you really don't want to eat excessive refined carbs or fats. And you optimal diet ends up looking kind of like low fat and low carb at the same time. And so really the reason you have this giant never ending war between low carb and low fat is that they're both actually right. I mean, let's face it. That's the only way you could have all these people who are militantly low carb or low fat for life. Uh, the only explanation for all of the su success stories and all the camps and all the fighting is that both of these people are, are correct. And somewhere in there, we forgot about protein that just got like discarded. Right. Or just protein was just like this default assumption that you kind of want 15% of your calories from protein and we forget about it. And then we have a holy war and how much the rest is between carbs and fat essentially. Right. Right. Like I think the observation is exactly right. There is some signal and truth that sustains why these mo these movements or these communities or these interest groups are vibrant and, and, and dynamic. If there was clearly something 100% wrong with any of these schools of thinking. They wouldn't survive the sort of the test of reality. So I think you're, you're actually spot on in the sense that um, because there's enough personal variation within just different groups of people and there is some sense to why either low carb or low fat seems to work for these types of people, both of them are sort of cherry picking the evidence against each other. And I think describing carbs and fats as just energy is like a better explanation, right? Just from the physics or engineering thinking, you want to have a theory that's basically this, a, a simpler theory that describes the observation tends to be a better one, right? And I think thinking about, again, what, you're, what you propose or suggest and write about is, okay, let's just think about it from an energy perspective. Like you have protein, which is essentially building blocks for muscle. So these are kind of functional tissues. And then you have both carbohydrate and, and fat as energy substrates. Um, I want to throw a little bit of a curveball at you. And I, I want to tie this in and maybe we cover a little bit of a new ground here is that one of the things that we work on or think about at HMN is ketones as a fourth macronutrient, right? So if you have exogenous ketones or ketones you can consume directly, through a food stuff or a drink. I really see ketones as a fourth macronutrient just being the same bucket as fats and carbohydrate, but obviously a different metabolic effect, right? So like fats, you might want to eat more of or less of given certain types of use cases, same thing with glucose or carbohydrate. And you probably have the same story with ketones. 
if you just eat a ton of ketones and fat and carbohydrate, you have the same energy toxicity problem that you describe. But each of these energy substrates have different variations. So maybe that could be, I want to just like throw that idea at you and, and, and get a sense of how you think about trading off these different types or forms of energy. Right, right. Well, the, like you pointed out, there's multiple fuels in your bloodstream at all times. You always have some ketones and you always have some free fatty acids and you always have glucose and triglycerides. And all of these tend to be problematic if they're, if they're too high, but none of them are problematic if you are, you know, in a caloric deficit. If you if you're very lean, if you have tons of room for storage in your liver muscle glycogen, tons for, of room for storage in your fat cells, all the fuels in your bloodstream are low, your insulin's low, then you can ingest any of these things and I think it's completely no problem at all. The problem comes when you're uh, energy toxic and all of the fuels in your bloodstream are too high and then you ingest even more fuel of any kind, your insulin level will go up, your insulin resistance will get worse and it's just going to be bad. And ketones, interestingly, it appears that they contribute to uh, glycation of proteins and damage to tissues uh, the same way that excess of glucose would. So I think if you're energy toxic, you really don't want to be ingesting any of this stuff. You don't want ketones, you don't want fat, you don't want uh, glycemic carbs. You really want to be on some sort of protein sparing modified fast where you're just eating protein and minerals and trying to run off the stored body fat that you have. Um, and the less energy you ingest, the better if you're over fat and have metabolic syndrome. But but uh, if you're nice and lean, I think there's nothing wrong with ingesting any of these energy forms or even all of them. Um, it just depends. Uh, it, it just comes down to your overall energy status. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it's just, yeah, I think it goes back to homeostasis energy balance. Again, just from mm -hmm. a systems perspective, you want to expend as much as you input. And I think the only, I would say, potential curveball is, are there different substrates that control appetite in a way that helps one get into a more of a satiated state or helps you prevent overeating, right? So, there is some early data that ketones uh, drive ghrelin, which suppresses appetite. Um, so, there's, I think, things on the margin that there are different use cases for different types of energy or different macronutrients. But I think the core point, which is that you don't want to be in an energy toxicity say that I think that I would hundred percent agree with that, that core uh, observation, that core point. And, and I think, I think every one of these macros is on a U shaped curve where you don't want to be too high and you don't want to be too low. You really don't want to be zero on any of these things um, or too high. And I, I think what we have in the modern diet is a specifically violently anti-ketogenic diet is what we're consuming. We're, we're on a ketone suppression diet in the standard American diet. That, that's what it's specifically targeted at. I mean, you know, your, your average person's eating, you know, 91 grams of protein a day, like 100 grams of fat, and then 300 grams of carbs. And it's just extraordinarily ketone suppressive that's the standard american diet so i do think like you say there might be some appetite suppression benefits from some amount of ketosis and that's probably why intermittent fasting seems to work and uh any sort of carbohydrate periodization or carb cycling or anything that resembles even a cyclical ketogenic diet is going to be in my opinion a huge upgrade and so yeah i, I like what you're saying in terms of describing the standard Western diet, I think you put it nicely that it's essentially, and I think yeah, there's like this nice graphic in the book where the normal diet, the standard Western diet today is essentially like a crazily high carbohydrate diet. So when people, I think when you describe low carb, it's just like normalizing the carb levels the way that's sensible. Most of the practical tips would be considered pretty ketogenic or low carb diet friendly, just because like the norms are, are so out of skew here. Mm -hmm. I think the probably the thing that you're concerned about is you counter swing so hard that you start eating a lot of exogenous fat and especially in a nutriently like low nutrient density 
fat. And I think that's where I think there's some interesting discussion and nuance where I think you're directionally, I think we directionally align around, okay, reduce carb intake because the standard Western diet's carb intake is like insanely high. Um, there are folks that are kind of super hardcore keto or very, very uh, low carb who say, hey, eat a lot of exogenous fat. So, what is your concern there? What is the misconception when people buy the low carb story, they directionally agree on the carbohydrate story, but then they load up on a ton of exogenous fat? What's the, what's the issue there? What would you have them consider when they're considering that type of diet? Right, right. So a lot of people have figured out, okay, carbs are specifically anti-ketogenic and they're massively overconsumed in our society. So eating less carbs is good. And I am completely on board with that. That's, I totally love that. I totally agree with that. Um, but then somehow we got to, if carbs are bad, fat must be good and more fat must be more good. And I don't really quite agree with that either. Um, in fact, if, and this is where I come at it from a very distinctly mechanical engineering point of view, I'm literally worried about where that fat's going to go after you've consumed it. 91% of the entire planet is over fat. Like they've literally exceeded the amount of healthy subcutaneous fat in their, in those adipocytes. And they're literally storing fat uh, where it's problematic, visceral fat, ectopic fat, liver fat, pancreatic fat, uh, you know, all of this sort of cardiometabolic fat. And so my concern is that if you're eating this extra fat and you've already filled up your fat stores, uh, that that can't be good. That's got to be a problem. And we have we have these crazy um, low fat studies where people just go on in a super low fat diet, and uh, within a few weeks they radically drop the amount of liver fat they've stored and pancreatic fat and insulin sensitivity goes way up. And so it's pretty obvious from the medical literature that eating fat is a problem and reducing fat if you're over fat is extraordinarily beneficial. So then you come to the point where you're like, well, what the heck can I eat? So I'm not starving to death. And it's pretty obvious that that's protein and minerals. You know, you're sort of a uh, uh, lean meat and green vegetable type gig, your, your protein sparing modified fast or whatever you want to call it, where you're basically low carb and low fat. And that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, but then again, all of these macros are on a U-shaped curve and you can't go to zero on fat, nor would I want anyone to. And you can't go to, well, you, I think going to zero on carbs might be a mistake because you might be shooting yourself in the foot in terms of satiety per calorie a little bit and overeating fat in an attempt to get some sort of satiety in a zero carb environment, if you know what I mean. Exactly. Like a nice articulation. So if you have a zero zone pie of calories you consume, okay, you're telling people, okay, carbs are bad, fat's bad. Then it's like, okay, necessarily you have to eat more protein. So what would, it, what would you respond to a devil's advocate who say, who talking about, Hey, like when you eat a super high protein diet, um, you might accrue liver damage and kidney damage and all of that. So what is your response in terms of, you know, too much of anything and now protein's the only thing left. Uh, what's the, how, how, how does one assuage those concerns? Well, interestingly, my diet, I mean, I wouldn't call it extremely high protein. A, a lot of people who go on this PE diet are they're eating a little bit more protein than they were before. They're eating a little bit more protein than average, but they're not eating huge increase in, in protein. Um, not even maybe 50% at the most. I mean, most people will go from, let's say you ate a hundred grams of protein a day before, and you go on my diet, you might be eating 150 grams of protein a day. You're actually not, your absolute protein is not going up that dramatically. What's happening is you have radically targeted protein with high protein percentage foods. So you're just done eating carbs and fats at a much lower energy intake. In other words, you're going to eat 100 grams of protein anyway, but how many hundreds of grams of carbs and fats did you have to eat to get that protein before you really prioritize the protein percentage of the food? You know what I mean? Like if I'm just eating beans and rice, I'm going to eat, 
you know, I'm going to massively overeat carbs and fats to get to my 100 grams of protein. But if I really go out of my way to leverage protein and I'm eating lean meat and green veggies, okay, maybe I'm going to eat 150 grams of protein, but wow, am I done eating at a much lower carb and fat intake? And that's where the magic happens. That's how, that's how it works. It's not really a quote unquote high protein diet. It's a high protein percentage. So what I'm suggesting is a much higher protein percentage. And then you're actually not eating that much more absolute protein. You're just eating way less carbs and fats because you don't need to eat that much energy to get your protein. Right. And that resonates with the protein leverage hypothesis, suggesting mm -hmm. that protein is one of the key things that signals satiety. So if you're getting that protein in first and in a way that's protein efficient in terms of percentages, then your pro or your fat and carbohydrate intake is much lower. So you're getting a lot less of this kind of useless extra energy. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So what does your macro percentage breakdown typically look like then? I mean, how does that sit in terms of kind of the traditional ways of dictating, you know, low fat, high carb, low carb, high fat? Well, I end up eating about 30% protein by calories. Mm -hmm. So on you know, average day, I might eat, you know, uh, 160 to 200 grams of protein and maybe 100 grams each carbs and fats. And that ends up being 30% protein. It's, it's typically, you know, 30% protein, 20% carbs and about 50 or 60 percent fat that's a typical breakdown for me uh the 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 protein is definitely not dominant by percent of calories fat is always dominant for me by percent of calories but protein is basically equal grams to carbs and fats together or even sometimes slightly higher interesting very cool basically half the mass of my food is is and ending up as protein. So the calories is because fats have more calories than either protein and carbs. So that's how the math nets out. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So do you measure your ketone levels? I mean, are you getting to ketosis? I used to measure my ketones. So I, you know, I own every ketone measurement thing in the world, but I don't do it regularly anymore because I haven't found it to be value added. And what I've found is that my Ketosis is pretty light no matter what I do. I mean, I can do a ton of high intensity exercise. I can do an extended fast. I can, uh, no matter what I do, my ketones are never crazy, crazy high. And um, so I find that I'm in a light ketosis. And then I'll typically eat carbs maybe once a day, you know, 100 grams or so. And that will. That will lessen my ketosis, but I, I'm doing some exercise, so it's I'm still technically in it slightly. And then the next morning, I'm usually basically back in a moderate ketosis. I mean, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. I've, I never pull down these really high numbers. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And have, I mean, have you tried just doing I mean, I'm sure if you just do an extended like three-day, yeah. five-day fast, you'll get there. That's true. It gets higher if I do an extended fast. But even then, it feels pretty low and I'm not sure what's up with that, except I've been doing this for a long time and and I have not always tested my ketones, especially in the beginning. So I wonder if I'm maybe just more efficient now or something. And I, what I wasn't, I didn't check ketones when I first went on low carb diet. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I mean, what we've seen through a lot of just personal experience as well as talking to a lot of folks who just measure ketones of, uh, essentially religiously is that you, your body just has more efficiency. Again, I think it goes back to energy balance perspective. You don't necessarily need 3.0 millimole ketones all the mm -hmm. time when you're just ambiently sitting around. Right. Right. That's, that's inefficient. You're essentially starting to pee some of this mm -hmm. out. Um, you just need the amount of beta hydroxy rate that your body needs or your brain needs at that specific moment, which suggests a lower ambient BHB level. Do you experiment or implement periodization or cycling? I would say those are getting a little bit more popular, especially with performance use cases where oftentimes athletes will periodize a more low carbohydrate uh, diet in the early parts of their season and ramp up carbohydrate as they get closer to competition. Is that something that you experiment with in terms of periodization or do you find that your 
kind of 30, 20, 50 ratio of protein, carb, fat seem pretty solid for your use cases? Uh, I would definitely call what I'm on a, a cyclical ketogenic diet. So I, I'm trying to reduce my carb frequency and I basically just eat carbs once a day. And then I also have some sort of bigger cycles where I might be lower carb during the week and higher carb on a weekend, or there are periods of time where I'm doing more uh, glycolytic exercise, I might eat more carbs then. So I would definitely describe it as a cyclical ketogenic diet. And the the main pattern is is daily carbohydrate in the evenings. And then I'm sort of uh, intentional and mindful about the carbohydrate. I'm trying to use it strategically, you know, you know what I mean? And I'm almost using it for a satiety and performance hack, where if I eat a small um, quantity of carbohydrate, I, uh, I feel better. I sleep better. I'm less hungry. I can get by on fewer calories in general. And I, I have a little bit higher performance with uh, glycolytic exercise. So it's, it's, uh, I'm basically being really strategic with carbs. Carbs are, car, because carbohydrate dramatically changes your whole body metabolism. It's something that in the book, I'm suggesting that people don't just never eat carbs, but try to be really mindful of what, what's going on with carbohydrate and try to use it uh, strategically. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, essentially, I mean, how you're talking about it is essentially where I've personally landed with my my nutrition as well, where I'll use a little bit of carbohydrate before workouts. And mm -hmm. I think the folks who take it a little bit too far are like that carbohydrates are evil, which I think is probably directionally correct for people that have metabolic syndrome or, 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 or diabetic. You got to be really dogmatic, like, oh, you know, very strict about some of these things because – that's one of the things that is striving um, or it's one of the easiest things to cut out that strives insulin resistance. But I think as one gets a little bit more focused on the performance perspective, then I think exactly how you're saying it, it, it is a, a useful tool mm -hmm. for performance. And just like you wouldn't recommend, and I wouldn't recommend like an Olympic athlete going into a, a like Olympic competition being fasted or just eating fat or you know just eating protein right right use the tool for the competition the proper tool so spot on there um what do you make make of the carnivore community obviously with such a high kind of emphasis on protein there's probably like a nice overlap with a lot of what carnivores talk about with what you talk about. What do you make of some of the arguments that there are some anti-nutrients that are pleasant in plants? I don't think either of us are as hardline on the evils of plants, but I'm curious to get your take on, on those arguments that you've seen uh, uh, being disseminated in the carnivore community. Well, okay. I have, I have a love hate with the carnivore <laughs> community. I love the carnivores because, you know, just thank God that they're balancing out the vegans, right? We have to have this yin and yang here, this balance to the universe. And I love the fact that they're um, highlighting that you can go on a pure carnivore diet. It totally works. Uh, you can be very healthy on these diets. I think it's been eye-opening to a lot of old school nutrition types. And I love that. I love that. Um, it's also one of the most brain dead, simple ways to go on a, a high protein to energy ratio diet and a high nutrient density diet and a low carb diet all at the same time. So carnivore is easy and it's brilliant and it's hard to screw up. Um, I also definitely believe that there are autoimmune diseases that are driven by plant foods. I mean, I have literally seen patients with uh, psoriasis on 80% of their body who just went gluten-free and it completely cleared up. So I have seen enough cases of uh, extreme improvements with uh, elimination of certain plant foods that I totally believe in this. And I also believe that the safest um, and most complete elimination diet you could possibly go on would be probably red meat and water. So I respect the hell out of anyone who's curing an autoimmune disease by doing this. However, I really hate the religiosity of either side, all plant or all animal, right? Like, like humans are unquestionably omnivores 
there you can't argue with that every human who's ever lived has eaten some combination of plants and animals we are omnivores it is a scientific fact and i really don't like the religiosity where like all plants are bad or all animals are bad and there has to be a happy medium like anytime i see some religious uh vegan i and, you know, they have a, a pretty reasonable diet. I'm like, you know, you could take this diet and add some fish in it or something, and it would just be the, even better. And I honestly feel the same way about a pure carnivore diet. You could take your pure religious carnivore, um, and then why why is it that they cannot eat, let's say, a low-sugar fruit, like, you know, uh, cucumbers or uh, something harmless like this? Uh, it's, it's going to broaden their nutrient pool. There's not going to be a downside. Um, there's, has to be some plant foods out there that everyone can tolerate. And so why wouldn't you try to make your diet as broad as possible? So uh, that's where I'm pushing back. I, I wish we could be a little bit less religious and a little bit less dogmatic about it. You know, I would like to see some people occasionally eating, you know, some benign harmless plant food, like some low sugar fruit or something and saying, oh, hey, look, this didn't kill me. And it makes the diet more sustainable because it's uh, less restrictive and it's easier to uh, maintain long term. And then I think we'd see even more people jumping on a, you know, car, a near carnivore or carnia carnivore adjacent diet or something like that, if that makes sense. I think you articulate kind of my pr perspective quite well as well. I mean, what do you make of what I seem to observe is that there just seems to be more folks who are sensitive to food nowadays. Mm -hmm. There's more of these cases of autoimmune issues. And to me, it seems like there's something in our environment or something that has happened in the last decade or so that's causing more of these instances because again i think you're right it doesn't make sense that we would be so delicate to eat a blueberry and then we would have psoriasis or have joint pain i mean to me it sounds like there's something else perhaps environmental toxins or something pollution our lifestyles that's potentially causing more autoimmune diseases from from diet is that what you observe i mean what do you make of folks that are seeing uh, symptom relief from carnivores, which I again I agree with you. I absolutely believe that people are seeing really great results from having a very nice, easy to implement elimination diet here. Well, okay. The reality is that there is more autoimmune disease today, but a lot of it is just because we're over fat. It's a lot of it is because of the increase in obesity. So you can draw a graph of symptom score from autoimmune disease versus fasting insulin level and it's just a straight line going up at a 45 degree angle. You can look at uh, asthma symptom scores with obesity and insulin resistance. You can look at psoriasis scores with insulin and um, obesity. You can look at uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So, so you think it's causative, not just the correlation? Uh, yes, yes. Li literally, the fatter and more insulin resistant you are, statistically speaking, the worse your autoimmune symptoms. And if you lose weight and get thinner and more insulin sensitive and metabolically healthy with any diet at all, you will improve statistically. I mean, it, it, everyone's different. So on an individual uh, basis, I can't guarantee anything, but statistically speaking, every autoimmune disease will improve as you lose weight and get thinner. And so any diet that accomplishes that will make you better. And that's why if you go on these vegan and vegetarian and low fat forums, you'll see a bazillion people who radically improved every chronic degenerative or autoimmune condition you can think of because they all get worse with insulin resistance. And anytime you go low anything, carbs or fats, um, you're going to improve insulin resistance. You're going to improve metabolic health. You're going to improve your autoimmune disease symptoms. Um, so there's a, the, the, the big confounder there is that anything that makes you thinner is going to make you better off. In, in this regard. Yeah, because I think that's where if one was trying to be ob ob as objective as possible, you see great anecdotes for carnivore mm -hmm. and you you have to concede that people report great anecdotes for vegan. Mm -hmm. And if you take it holistically, it's like, okay, people are seeing great results and it's like, okay, um, how, how do you explain this? And I think then, then your argument would be on the margin. Some folks who just seem to get flare-ups when they 
claim that they eat, you know, a, a Brussels sprout and they have symptoms. Right. That you would say is on the margin for folks who are a little bit more bespoke uh, condition versus directionally just being thinner helps, you know, drives the majority of the benefit. Well, I mean, there's always people who really do have individual food intolerances. I mean, I see people uh, in the clinic who are literally deathly allergic to eggs or shellfish or fish or tree nuts or peanuts or shrimp or something uh, very specific. I see people with oral allergy syndrome and they just they cannot eat a kiwi fruit raw, uh, but they microwave it and denature the proteins and then they can eat it. And it, so I see all these very peculiar, very specific, very individual, very real food intolerances and food allergies. And I know that there's a ton of that out there. And so I can only really speak on a, on a statistical levels, you know, statistically, humans are omnivores and statistically, the thinner you are, the healthier you are. But I'm never going to really argue with somebody who personally for themselves found, oh, wow, the second I got got rid of dairy, I feel awesome and all this stuff went away because they might have a very real cow's milk protein allergy or something like that. So it's like everyone's different and uh, that makes it tricky, <laughs> you know? So I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue with anyone who got uh, some sort of religious miracle cure from their um, carnivore vegan diet because I know that does actually happen. Absolutely. So I want to get your thoughts on intermittent fasting. That was, you know, one of the, uh, I would say, most popular topics that a lot of folks in our community have experimented with. And how do you view a time restriction with what you talk about with the PE diet, which is, you know, primarily, I would say, more focused on uh, kind of the macronutrient breakdown. Um, if you look at just the possible ways to manipulate diets, it's time restriction, restricting on macronutrient percentages, and then restricting on overall calories. Mm -hmm. And it would it be fair to say that the P diet focuses kind of on the macro percentage and potentially on the calorie counts. But obviously, it sounds like time restriction could be valuable within the PE diet context as well. So, what are your thoughts on fasting routines? Oh, well, I, I love time restricted feeding or intermittent fasting or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think that's on a U-shaped curve as well, and you kind of want to hit the sweet spot of that curve. And so in the book, I highly recommend a 16-8 for most people. I think if I had to just pick any sort of eating scheme for the whole planet, um, I would definitely aim for like a 16-8 as sort of a starting starting point. And, and I think that that's Hugely beneficial, but I th honestly think that the two reasons that intermittent fasting is good is number one, it forces you to become a lot more fat adapted. You uh, you have to be better at just living off of stored body fat, which is what we're designed to do, right? We're supposed to burn body fat continuously and then refuel every once in a while. And so it forces people to get better at that. It really helps people get in touch with true hunger and fullness as well. Um, if you're just, you know, mindlessly eating every 15 minutes for your entire waking day, you don't really get a good chance to either get fat adapted or get into, into touch with this hunger and fullness thing. So I love intermittent fasting for that reason. I also think that the carbohydrate um, periodization is the, the biggest uh, that's the most important thing that intermittent fasting is doing is decreasing carbohydrate frequency. In other words, if you're eating, if you're not eating any carbs, I think intermittent fasting is less important and less of a factor. Uh, there might, it might be that reducing carbohydrate frequency is the only thing that's driving the benefits of intermittent fasting. I certainly think that's number one. Uh, the other thing about intermittent fasting is that the thinner you get, the leaner you get, the less helpful it is and the less beneficial it is and the less you really want to do it. So, um, you know, I see these people who are um, dieting down for a, for an aesthetic competition, you know, your, your fitness models, your aesthetic athletes, your bikini models and your bodybuilders that by the time they get really lean, they wake up in the morning and they're starving and they're eating protein every, you know, four to six hours all day long to just not lose lean mass. And the it, intermittent fasting seems to be 
unhelpful for these people and probably bad. And they really, really struggle. I mean, you get really hungry. If you're, if your glycogen stores are low and your fat stores are low and you can't get enough calories from your fat cells and you're not eating protein for a period of hours, you're literally going to chew up your lean mass for energy to some extent. And that makes people just hungry as hell. And so if you're already on this very high protein, low energy diet, and you're really, really lean, uh, I think intermittent fasting is probably bad. You, you want to toss that out the window. And, and I, I find that people who, who, uh, find fasting effortless, like if you're like, oh, okay, I just want you for a week. It's no big deal. It's no problem. That's easy for me. Uh, you're probably too fat. I hate to say it. No, seriously. Like, like if you can effortlessly fast for days and weeks, you're way, way, way too fat. I mean, that's, and then I'm glad you're fasting, I guess. <laughs> but, um, you take someone in that setting and get them really, really lean, like, you know, like stage lean, they're not doing any intermittent fasting. They wake up hungry. They go to bed hungry. They're hungry all the time. There's no intermittent fasting there. Uh, the other thing is, you know, if you're super thin and the only food you have is like chicken breast and salad or something really lean, really high protein, really low energy, uh, you're not going to be intermittent fasting. You're going to be eating that stuff, you know, every couple hours. You're going to be eating all the time. Yeah, no, I think there's a couple things that I think were interesting that you mentioned, which is that one, are the benefits of fasting simply carbohydrate restriction? And when one is in carbohydrate restriction, one is likely to produce ketones. So I think that's an interesting scientific open area where we see longevity benefits from calorie restriction. But is that calorie restriction? Is that carbohydrate restriction? Is that the process of ketogenesis? And then two, I think the observation around should one be that comfortable fasting for a long time? I think that's an interesting point because you see some longevity influencers, longevity doctors. I know that Peter Artia talks about doing quarterly, three-day, five-day, seven-day fasts. Is there some evidence or mechanism there in terms of triggering autophagy, which I think is like kind of the main reason why folks like Atia would recommend doing something like this? What do you make of that rationale? Well, okay, so... <clears throat> The problem here is uh, you can stimulate autophagy with anything that makes you hypocaloric. So just walking around thinner, you're going to have more autophagy. Uh, just um, doing more exercise and being thinner, you're going to have more uh, opportunities in the day for autophagy. So, I, you know, I I think that someone, I mean, I, I love Dr. Atia and I respect the hell out of him, but we don't know that he couldn't trade in his week, his quarterly week of fasting for just being thinner 24 seven all the rest of the year. You know what I mean? That those might be equivalent. And so it's possible that he could eat some, you know, small high nutrient dense protein and veggie meal uh, every hour of the entire day, every day but just be thinner and be doing more exercise and carrying less body fat, he's going to have lower fasting insulin. He's going to have lower triglycerides. He's going to be in an autophagy state more often just from a hypocaloric uh, standpoint and a lower basal insulin standpoint. So how do we know that you could really, um, I, I mean, like I, I honestly think that maybe just existing in a leaner state might be, uh, equivalent to these periodic, I'm not going to eat for a week type things. And, and since all of this needs to be on a U-shaped curve, I don't know that it's better to just eat more every day, uh, 11 weeks out of the quarter, and then just don't eat for an entire week, one week out of the quarter. I don't know that that's really any better than just somehow managing to walk around leaner and eating a little bit less every day continuously. So I personally like like something that's on a on a on a smaller cycle and a smaller scale. You know what I mean? Like I might daily do a, a moderate intermittent fast instead of this once every three months, one week thing. And, and I don't know who's right. I don't know which is better. I I don't know if 
I don't think anyone knows that, and I don't even know if it's currently knowable, but it's just all interesting. I, I don't know if it's a problem or not a problem, but just that no one is not a good, consistent measure of what of autophagy. Mm-hmm. And of course, autophagy is also very tissue specific. I mean, you know, is the is your neuron in the state of autophagy versus your liver versus your muscle? Right, right. So I think it's just like a very complicated question mm-hmm. that I think is in common discussions like, oh, you're in an autophagy state now. It's like, well, you, you, no one's you really knows how to measure it and your body's constantly in switching between catabolism and anabolism mm-hmm. and it probably depends on like what part of your body you're talking about so i think it's a very complicated question that again i think no one knows how to measure so i think people are kind of trying things uh, and it's not clear what is evidence-based versus what is kind of theoretically mechanistically kind of making sense and i think there's like a crossover on lifestyle what kind of makes sense for a person at a time right one of the interesting things that I've heard you talk about on previous conversations is your thoughts on the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis. And obviously, that's, I would say, key talking points within the low carb community that carbohydrates drive insulin, which drives insulin resistance, which is kind of the root of all evil for all these chronic decision uh, conditions that you, we talked about, you know from metabolic syndrome to neurological conditions like Alzheimer's. I, I think I have a sense of your thoughts there given the context of energy balance, but curious to help to have you unpack your thoughts on the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis to our audience here. Well, I have a couple problems with the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis. Um, first of all, okay, white fish, for example, spikes insulin almost as high as you know bread or some really high glycemic carbohydrate. But uh, so so protein is insulinogenic and you're getting a huge spike of insulin from like fish, for example. But what would happen to you if the only food I gave you to eat is white fish or some super low fat fish? I mean, you would be the thinnest person on the planet right up until the point where you died of low body fat. I mean, you literally couldn't even survive. You wouldn't be able to eat yourself out of that much energy deficit. And so how again does eating a food that spikes your insulin make you fat and insulin resistant? (laughs) So I have a huge, huge problem with it. Um, But then the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis, people are like, well, no, what really happens is that when you eat glycemic carbs that raise glucose, that shuts off fat oxidation and you're internally starving and your cells don't have enough fat. The problem with that is that these people, um, if you're over fat, even if you eat carbohydrate, glycemic glucose producing carbs, you're still going to have way too much fat everywhere. There's too much fat in your cells. There's too much fat in your bloodstream. Uh, your uh, over fat and pre-diabetic insulin resistant people have more fat in their circulation than thin people. They have more free fatty acids. They have higher triglycerides. They have more uh, sum total of all fuels in the bloodstream. They're, I mean, they're really not starving to death internally, either from a bloodstream point of view or from an intracellular point of view. Um, yes, lipolysis gets turned off with uh, increases in insulin, but these people have so much fat to begin with that I don't think that's really the problem. So I know that carbohydrate is bad um, for people who are trying to lose weight. But I think the reason that it's bad is that you're bad at fat oxidation. Um, you're always burning glucose. So the, the metabolic machinery in your mitochondria to uh, effectively ox- oxidize fat and run your whole metabolism off fat, you're just not good at that. It's like something you need to exercise. You have to get better at fat oxidation. You have to get better at meeting your metabolic needs with just fat. And the best way to do that is, well, there are two ways to do that. Number one, don't eat any carbs. So you have to burn fat 24 seven. Number two, exercise. So you have to burn even more fat 24 seven. And so I love carbohydrate restriction because it gets people more fat adapted and better at burning fat. But I don't really buy the, if you eat a food that spikes insulin, it's going to make you gain weight because of the what happens when you eat lean protein. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great 
point there. And I think, again, I, go, I think to me, it, it goes back to the, again, the point around energy. The body evolved to process both carbohydrate and fat. And just to say one of these substrates is dogmatically, simply, reductionlessly evil is just it simplifies the story too much, mm-hmm. right? And I think it's like folks on the, that are, are driving the carbohydrate insulin, insulin hypothesis probably will be directionally correct for tactical advice for 80% of people, which is that, mm-hmm. yeah, cut out high glycemic foods. You'll probably have better health outcomes. I agree. At a certain point, people will want to, hopefully, will want to understand the mechanisms. And I think your example with white fish just kind of, breaks a hypothesis right uh, i mean that's a, that's a testable experiment and it'd be great to have some of the uh, proponents there just describe and argue why like this, this is still captured in their model or their hypothesis one of the interesting things i want to kind of pivot to is that beyond just diet you also have you know it, it, with sort of the second half of the book or in the sections in the book you also talk about exercise i'm curious to get your philosophy on exercise because we talk a lot about the inputs into your body here with nutrition. You got to spend this energy somehow. Well, okay. I love exercise. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think anyone is ever going to reach their body composition and health goals without, you know, 50-50 diet and exercise. Exercise is crucial. Exercise is, um, it's the missing piece of the puzzle for, for so many in the low carb community. And I hate to say that, but uh, exercise is spectacular. And my take on exercise is intensity. So I think that your whole goal in in life from a metabolic standpoint should be getting the highest lean mass you can and the lowest fat mass uh, you know, within reason. These are both on a U-shaped curve, but you want a reasonably high lean mass and a reasonably low fat mass. And you're never going to get there without some sort of high intensity resistance exercise. I I like to do resistance exercise to failure, like really, really crank up the intensity because that seems to drive the types of adaptations you're looking for um, more than anything else. And it also tends to be the most time efficient. So in the book, I'm describing these really, really brief uh, resistance exercise bouts with just absolute maximum intensity. So anytime you're doing resistance exercise, you can alter uh, intensity, frequency, and duration or volume. And what I've done is absolutely maxed out, number one, the intensity, and then number two, the frequency, uh, but the volume and uh, is really, really tiny. This ends up being the most time efficient uh, form of exercise on the planet. So I, I'm telling people to do these very small sets of uh, push, pull, and legs, you know, resistance training with the highest intensity you can possibly generate. So basically, you know, let's say you're doing push ups. Instead of doing 20 push ups every day, you just do a single set of push ups all the way to failure. I mean, like beyond failure. You do push ups till you literally can't push up another inch, and then you hold isometrically for as long as you can, and then you do the slowest eccentric or negative that you can, and then you collapse on the ground. You know what I mean? This whole thing might take less than 60 seconds, but you, you're you really maxing out the intensity and that communicates to your body that you have to have more muscle. You have to be stronger. You have to have uh, more, uh, more strength and more um, endurance in, in your muscles. And, you, and your body responds by basically adapting to this uh, extreme stressor is adapt or die. Your body's like, oh, wow, we almost died. So we have to be stronger and better. And that's how you build muscle in the very least amount of time possible. Yeah. I think if people really push and keep the intensity high, it's surprising how quick you exhaust yourself. So in terms of getting that intensity up, so it sounds like you're doing primarily body weight. I mean, do you try to load up even more intensity with weight vests, you know, squats, barbells or do you find that you can maintain or achieve that level of intensity by just speed and consistency of quality of motion and just really exhausting yourself well what i find is i have to because i'm trying to do it with just body weight i have to increase the 
the leverage with the exercise and make it harder somehow. Uh, you know, push-ups, for example, you start out, if you can't do a push-up and you're really out of shape, you start out with a wall push-up, which is super easy and basically anyone on earth can do it. And then as you get stronger, you go to push-ups on a couch or a chair or a bench or an elevated surface. And then you can graduate to, you know, push-ups on your knees. And once that's too easy and you can do more than 10 of those too easily, then you switch to push-ups on your toes. And once those are easy, uh, you go to a diamond push-up where your hands are touching in front of your chest. And once that's too easy, you start working on your one-arm push-ups. And eventually you get to the point where you have to do single limb movements, like one-arm push-ups, one-arm pull-ups, and one-leg squats. And all of these are so insanely difficult that almost no one on the planet can do even one of them, let alone a set of 10. So you're basically safe with body weight movements your entire life, unless you can do 10 extremely clean, perfect form, slow one arm pull-ups, then you haven't run out of body weight progression on pulling moves. And I don't know about you, but nobody, no one can do this. Like literally no one. So you're not going to run out of progressions with body weight. Yeah. I mean, right now, my current exercise routine is doing a Murph a day. So I've done... 18 Murphs in a row. So today will be, uh, you know, probably after this conversation, I got to do my 19th Murph. Mm -hmm. I kind of challenge my audience to do something every single day. And my something is doing a Murph, which is a mile run, 100 push-ups, two, uh, 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 bodyweight squats, and a uh, finisher with another mile run. So, essentially hitting the, the, the same core exercise that mm -hmm. you're describing, but I'm not doing it as I guess high intensity, um, you know, a uh, hundred, two hundred, three hundred reps is kind of high, but I would say similar principles in terms of pull, push, and 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 and, and leg movements mm -hmm. um, to pretty exhaustion. But yeah, I think in terms of just like flucking on like one arm pull ups, definitely like that the the hangs and the you can definitely get a long way with calisthenics. I think a lot of the typical workout folks love like the heavy weights, and I think the injury risk there is kind of high. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think, I think you've probably, we've all been there where you just crank up too heavy of a squat, too heavy of a, of a bench press and you just like tweak your back or something and you can get similar qualities of motion just with body weight and have a lot less injury risk. Yeah. I mean, I just, I want people to be able to do this when they're 90 or something. And I have so many people who have just had to retire from barbell lifts because they hurt themselves. And it's just, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying that uh, body weight's better than weights. I'm just saying it's free and it's right there in front of you at all times. And it's so convenient and it's so safe. And the bar to entry is so low that it's a really good route. I wish more people would, you know, sign up. I mean, I think it's kind of like the variation, right? I think it's kind of like periodizing nutrition, you know, a little bit of intermittent fasting, a little bit of variation with foods. I think you can have kind of a similar aesthetic with exercise. Mm -hmm. Uh, mix up a little bit, but I think calisthenics kind of, you, you can get a lot with the basics because I think what you're, what we're saying here. Right. Right. And, and I, I'm just going to say, you know, if you can't do 10 perfect form, really clean push-ups, I mean, you probably have no business even doing a bench press, <laughs> you know, so let's get started on some of these body weight moves. And then, and then if you want to, if you can afford the gym, you have time for the gym and you can do it safely, these movement patterns safely without getting hurt, then that's awesome. You want to do whatever exercise you enjoy and that you're going to want to do and continue doing. And I have nothing against weights. I just, um, I want more people out there doing stuff. And I think body weight's a good way to dive in. 100%. I uh, can't agree more with that. So, you know, my last question here, infinite resources and human guinea pigs to command around as you see fit. What experiment would you like to run? Would you want to, you know, RCT, the PE diet against other forms of diets? You know, what is your dream experiment here? Yeah, I would love to do some sort of uh, uh, trial to see at what macronutrient combination do people just spontaneously ad lib, eat the very least and end up the very thinnest. And we have some retrospective studies that suggest that happens at uh, two grams of protein to one gram of fat 
in a fairly low carb setting at maybe 10 or 20% carbohydrate, which honestly ends up like look, uh, looking like just eating ground beef and a salad pretty much. And, uh, so that, that is what I would like to see. I would like to see, you know, somebody find out at exactly what macronutrient spread do the majority of people eat the least. And it, I do think it's going to be in a fairly high protein, low carb setting. Um, but I would love to see that study done. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that'd be very additive to human understanding of ourselves. Well, thanks so much for taking the time. I think it was a really helpful, illuminating conversation. I think it really helps unpack some of the nuances here with diet and nutrition. And I think, again, the model that you describe around energy versus some sort of holy war between fats and carbs, I think is a great way to approach and think about this space from a holistic structural perspective. And where do people tune in to learn more about, uh, follow along and find the PE book? Oh, well, uh, we're selling the book at the PE diet dot com uh the uh, pe stands for protein to energy so the pe diet.com is the best place to uh download a pdf of the book and you can find me online i'm on twitter it's where i'm most active at ted neiman awesome thanks so much oh thank you for having me thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the hvmn podcast if you're interested to learn more about hvmn and our offerings visit hvmn.com slash pod Please remember to subscribe. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please give this video a like and remember to hit that bell to get notified whenever we post. We also have a dedicated Discord server, which you can join by first taking a short survey and then I'll personally send you an invite to join the community there. The link to that survey will be in the description along with any other relevant links. And we'll see you all next week.